three, welcome to the chapter four summary keynote. And in the next three chapters, we're going to talk about variables and we're going to take a look at numerical and categorical. And really the numerical are what's going to take hold in chapters four and then we kind of combo five and six. And then categorical is going to come back into play in chapter seven. Now on the numerical side of things, right, we've got discrete and continuous. And chapter four, oops, excuse me, in categorical, we have the just, you know, non-numeric, the words. Um, and in chapter four, we're going to look at discrete random variables. And then when we combo chapter five and six, we're going to look at continuous numerical variables. And then, like I said, in chapter seven, we're still going to stick with numerical, but we're going to circle back around to categorical. So that's how this stuff is starting to play out. So I'll, I'll just write that here, that this part here is going to be chapter four. Right, this is going to be chapters five and six, and we combo those, and then we're going to come back around to categorical variables in chapter seven, but we'll still have some numerical variables in chapter seven. So chapter seven will be both categorical and numerical. But like I said, for right now, we're, we're going to take a look at the discretes. And there's the, the type that we do with the pro, um, making the tables for our PDF and then the, the, the special case, the binomial. So let's look a little further. All right, so if you hear me talk about a PDF, all right, we have a probability distribution function, and that's where you're seeing the P, the D, and the F from PDF. Now, most of the time we make a table, but you could also make a histogram, all right? And you could even make a graph if you wanted. Well, a histogram is a graph, but, but those are the probably the most common types, the table and the histogram. Um, you could have a formula at times, but we're really gonna stick to the table primarily, and then if you wanted to, you could make your histogram. Now on, on your table, your top row, right, we always put our sample space. So when you hear me say values of the variable x, right, this is going to be our sample space. So we're always going to put out, we're going to make a list of what is possible, right? And then on the bottom row, we're going to talk about what is probable. And these probabilities, right, that bottom row, it's got to have probabilities that total out to one. So if this was my PDF table, and again, this is just straight up Google images, my favorite thing, you can see that those three numbers add up to one, those three probabilities. And also these three numbers in here, they have to be numbers between zero and one on top of the fact that they have to total out to one. Here's a longer looking PDF. This is basically um, rolling two die and adding the sum of the faces of the two die. And there's the PDF, but that, that those bottom numbers I circled, not only are individually those numbers between zero and one, but these have to sum to one, right? These bottom numbers always have to sum to one. And here, again, Google Images, it just happened that this was written as columns, all right? And that probability column, that would need to sum to one in order to be a legitimate PDF. All right, so in terms of these PDFs, in terms of the, the big one, like how do we get that bottom row? Well, sometimes it'll be given to you and sometimes it won't. And when I say it, sometimes the probabilities are just straight up given to you and sometimes they're not. So let's talk about strategies for getting that bottom row. Um, if they're not given to you, all right, draw a picture of the situation. And a lot of them are gonna be tables and charts. Now these are ones, I think this was about um, the different colors in a car. This is about who is eating breakfast, that kind of thing. If the table's given to you, great. But there are going to be some problems where you have to create your own PDF. You have to create your own table. Now, when that happens, there's sometimes that we'll be using these formulas that we picked up in Chapter 3. And if you remember, there's the addition rule, the multiplication rule, the independence formulas, the mutually exclusive formula. All right, so sometimes you'll have to circle back to your formulas in Chapter 3. Sometimes you'll need to make a Venn diagram. And what you've seen the most often in chapter four is the tree diagram. That one comes up the most often. All right, so in terms of these PDFs, once we've established a PDF, all right, so once you know the distribution, there are some common questions that we tend to get asked. We tend to get asked, hey, what's the mean? What's the standard deviation? And can you calculate a probability? All right, now, if you have just your regular PDF, your table PDF, and you're using that, that giant trait table I gave you, and you're in that first column, right? we've talked about how calculating the mean and standard deviation, a lot of times we use one bar stats, L1, L2, right? pending that we have our sample space in L1 and those probabilities in L2. Now, calculating the probabilities in and of themselves, again, they, you gotta use a table or a formula, a Venn or a tree. All right, 
But moving along here, the, the mean formula, the thing that is actually getting run when we do one var stat L1 L2 is this mean formula. So you see this symbol here, that's mu, right? That is our population mean. And that is a parameter. All right, and a lot of times we don't actually have mu, we have x bar instead. This bad boy here, all right, that is sigma squared, if I wanna actually say that out loud. But I wanna remind you that this is the population variance. All right, and it is not the standard deviation. So let me write variance here. All right, but note that here, and let me change colors on this, this is sigma squared. So if you wanna get back down to the standard deviation, what you would need to do is if you take the square root of that number, that's how you get to sigma, and that's the population standard deviation. So when I say up here, hey, get me the standard deviation, you would need to actually apply that square root. Now, that's all fine. When you do one bar stats, L1, L2, it directly gets you to the standard deviation. All right, because at this point, we have technology to get us past these two formulas. I get to be that person that says, like, back in my day, I had to do this. And back in my day, I had to do these formulas, right? We didn't have technology. Um, it was it was a different time. But you got it now. So let's let's use all that that technology to get us through the number crunching a little bit faster. Okay, so that's just your basic discrete random variable. And we talked about the special case, which was the binomial distribution. Oops, I forgot to add here. It might be helpful to crunch those numbers on your calculator using your lists. And that's how I would do it. I would always use technology at this point. Okay, now I want to talk about the binomial distribution. I, and I think one of the struggles we tend to have in this chapter is recognizing that you are in a binomial experiment, right? Because it's, it's so overwhelming to be like, okay, I gotta make this table, I gotta make a tree diagram. If, if things seem really overwhelming, just go ahead and say, hey, maybe this is a binomial experiment. Let me check through my four properties and see if it is a binomial experiment. Because if it is, I don't need to make the table and I get some quicker probability formulas, right? I get some calculator commands that help me jump through those problems faster, right? It, it's, I get to um, skip over making that tree diagram, but the, the trick is to remember and really to recognize you're in a binomial experiment. So if you're in a binomial experiment, there's four properties, all right? In, in your experiment, there has to be two mutually exclusive outcomes. You have to have something that you call a success and something that you call a failure. And you've been seeing me put quote marks around success and failure because it's all um, dependent on the, on the context of the problem. So there needs to be something that we can call a success. We need to have a fixed number of trials. The trials need to be independent of one another, right? So success on one trial doesn't influence the success on the next trial. The probability of success has to be the same for each trial. And I wanna really focus in on these two here. Uh, they're all important, these four properties, but these two are, I, w I don't want to say more important, but they have, they're so important that they have their own letters. So the fixed number of trials is called N, and the probability of success is called P. And we use those two problems, or two, excuse me, those two numbers to make the squiggles. And I say the squiggles because that symbol right there, the little, uh, is distributed by, it looks like a tilde, I think that's how we called it. Um, that that's when we're using the N and P, right? So the fixed number of trials and the probability of success. And this is in lieu of a table. So I'm going to put in lieu of a table, meaning I don't have to make that table with probably, excuse me, sample space in the top, probabilities in the bottom. I don't need to do that. I can just write this symbol instead. And I would argue it's so much faster. Okay. So you pick up some formulas from recognizing that you're in a binomial experiment. Here is the probability formula, right? Here is the mean, and here is the standard deviation. So let me make sure we're clear on this. This is how to calculate a probability, and we're about to discuss a second way to do it, right? Here is the mean formula, and here is the standard deviation. Now I have all of this listed out in your trait table, so make sure you're using that. And keep in mind, if I wanted to go from this number here to my variance, I would square it. All right, Ooh, I root all over that, so let me hit done here. So we will use binomial PDF and CDF instead of this formula here. Oops, and 
let me back out of that. We'll use binomial PDF and CDF instead of the formula, but make sure you understand that formula and you could recognize it in a multiple choice question. So I wanna focus in on the calculator commands. We picked up two of them in this chapter. So we've got binomial PDF and binomial CDF. So it's the PDF and the CDF that make the difference there. Now, you would use binomial PDF if you had an equal sign right in here. So whenever you have the equal sign, go ahead and use binomial PDF, all right, for a particular value of x. All right, if you're gonna use binomial CDF, that's fine, just know that there's a special case of when you can use it. It is when you have cumulative values for your variable, and it has to be less than or equal to, right? It has to be in that, oops, let me draw it over here, in that on down mode. Let me see if I can get that circled. All right, it has to be less than or equal to. So I wanna be clear here. We do not have a calculator command for greater than. Oops, we do not have one for greater than or equal to, and we do not want have one for less than. If you need any of these calculator commands, you have to somehow combine a PDF and a CDF. And especially for these greater thans and greater than or equal to, a lot of times we're gonna use that binomial CDF in conjunction with the complement rule, all right? You're gonna have a one minus some kind of probability like x less than or equal to seven, something like that, just depending on what the, the problem says. So we've got two calculator commands, and then with those two calculator commands for equals and less than or equal to, we can get to the other commands, meaning greater than, greater than or equal to, or strictly less than. All right, so we're gonna flip, we're gonna practice this. I want you to take a look at this problem and pause the video right now. All right, so read this out, pause it, and see if you can come up with the answer, and then when you're ready, unpause it. So you're gonna sell sandwiches at your family's deli. You can only sell chicken or pork sandwiches. 70% of the people uh, choose chicken and the rest choose pork. What is the probability of selling two chicken sandwiches to the next three customers? So I see the word probability here, okay? And I wanna sell chicken sandwiches to the next three customers. So my variable here, this is gonna be, if I'm talking to three folks, right, this is gonna be the number of people who order chicken sandwiches. And I'm gonna even go so far as to say chicken sandwich in my sample of three. Right? So if I think about my sample space, I could have zero people order a chicken sandwich, one person order a chicken sandwich, two or three. So if I was going to make a table, right, and I'm gonna just squeeze this in here, I would have zero, one, two, or three up here. Okay, and I can see that there's a tree diagram forming, right? So if I think about the tree diagram, right, that first person is either gonna pick chicken or pork, right, and then chicken or pork chicken or pork, and I can extend this, right? And actually that is what the tree diagram would look like. And then it says, I want exactly two folks to pick chicken. Well, if two folks are picking chicken, then by complement, one has to be picking pork. So you can see my branches, right? Chicken, chicken, pork, right? I could have also had chicken, pork, chicken, or I could have had pork, chicken, chicken. Those are the three different ways that exactly two customers of my next three customers can chick, uh, can chick can pick a chicken sandwich. And if you remember from chapter three, I'm gonna multiply the appropriate branches. So in this topmost branch here, you see 0 0.7, 0 0.7, 0 0.3. And then you see 0 0.7, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, and finally 0 0.3, 0 0.7, 0 0.7. And yes, the probabilities are all the same because ultimately two people are picking chicken and one is picking pork. And because they're disjoint, if you remember from chapter three, we're gonna add those three probabilities together. And when I do that, I'm gonna multiply 0.147 by three and I get 0.441. And that is one way to do this problem. And that's great. But I would also say, hey, if you recognize this is binomial, you can get through this problem a lot faster. And is it binomial? Sure, let's go through it. I have a fixed number of trials, right? I'm gonna call a success, a customer ordering, ordering a chicken sandwich. All right, I'm gonna assume that my trials are independent because one customer ordering a chicken or pork sandwich has no effect on the next customer or ordering a chicken or pork sandwich. And they straight up tell me in the problem that the probability that someone orders a chicken sandwich is 70%, right? So by complement, ordering a pork sandwich happens 30% of the time. 
But since I can check through all of these, I get to say that this is binomially distributed. I've got three customers and the probability I have a success on any one customer is 70%. So I get that binomial distribution. I'm calculating a probability and I want exactly two. That's why you see the equals two right there. Here I am using the formula, right? And this three choose two happens to do with the three branches that are here. And then two successes, right? Two folks picking chicken, one person picking pork. And that's great to use the formula, but because I have this equal sign here, <coughs> oh, excuse me. Because I have this equal sign here, I'm gonna use binomial PDF, right? N, P, K, and I get 0. 0.441. And for me, in my, my personal opinion is using the binomial PDF is faster because I didn't have to write this giant tree diagram. But if you like the tree diagram, by all means, use it. It's just a matter of if you recognize something's binomial, you can go a bit faster. All right, the last concept we talked about in this chapter was the law of large numbers, right? And we saw that with the little um, penny experiment, right? So as the number of repetitions of a random experiment increase, right? And that means you just keep running your experiment over and over and over again. The relative frequency of this event, meaning what you see in front of you, will converge, which means gets closer to the probability of the event. So if we were flipping a coin, a fair coin, and this is what we saw in our little applet, if we were flipping a fair coin, if I continued to flip, eventually the proportion of heads would be 50%. It might not be 50% right away, I might initially just have a run of heads and it looks like I'm flipping heads like 70% of the time, but in the long run, it will even out. So that's saying what you see in front of you will get closer to what you expect to see the longer your experiment goes on, or I should say the more repetitions of your experiment. Okay. All right. So with that, that wraps up chapter four. Thanks so much, gang. And I will see you soon. Okay. Bye.